Okay, wow. Um, I want to thank Barbie uh, once again for inviting me to be here at Annenberg this for the semester, and thank you for that incredible introduction. Can I have that? <laughs> um, I also want to thank all of the faculty and graduate students at Annenberg for making me feel so welcome, and um, especially my, my graduate students, the graduate students in my course were having a great time, and I'm really enjoying my uh, semester here. What I'm going to talk about today um, is some of the research that I've been doing on the field of forensic video analysis. This is a field of forensic science, and it's also an emerging area of media expertise in law enforcement and security. So an official definition of forensic video analysis provided by the Law Enforcement and Emergency Services Video Association, um, or LEVA, is the scientific examination, comparison, and or evaluation of video in legal matters. Video evidence itself is not new, and LEVA, this professional association, which I'm going to tell you a lot about tonight, um, which was formed in 1989. So it's the, the sort of beginnings of the professionalization of this field um, kind of date back a little while. Um, it's probably apparent by the camera in their logo, um, which this is no longer uh, this, in their logo, this particular camera. Um, they got rid of it and some, sometime since I began doing this research. I didn't quite notice exactly when. So um, while so video evidence has been around for a while, the rise of video forensics as a professional field has really taken off in response to the massive proliferation of uh, video surveillance, and especially this proliferation of CCTV systems over the last several decades. And also, of course, it's been um, the spread of smartphones and other camera-equipped devices have, have been important um, for this kind of avalanche of um, video that we are sort of taking of our lives. Video evidence is now the most prolific form of evidence in the legal system. So I've approached this topic through the lenses of media studies and science and technology studies and surveillance studies, not criminology or forensics. So I'm not particularly interested or qualified to help this field do its work more effectively. And I don't envision myself, for example, um, participating in the design of video forensic systems or the development of standard standards for the proper handling of video evidence. I would be interested in any contributions that this project might make to um, the ethical practice in this domain. But my interests are really in the field of video forensics as an interesting, um, I'm, I'm thinking of it as a very interesting and important area for understanding tr transformations in the practices of objectivity associated with images and image analysis. And so here I'm relying heavily on Lorraine Dastin and Peter Gallison's historical study of objectivity in scientific imaging. I also think it's an interesting and important field for understanding the materiality of digital media and the ways that materiality matters, not only to the storage and circulation of images, but also to their, uh, their appearance and their interpretation. The idea that digital media are immaterial and that their so-called immateriality is what distinguishes them from analog media has been pretty well taken down at this point. But it remains to be better understood what is different about the materialities of digital media and why their unique material forms matter. So there's a, a literature emerging on forensics from the perspective of media and cultural studies that addresses these questions, including these two great books by Matthew Kirschenbaum and Greg Siegel. Um, I'm also looking forward to Susan Shupley's forthcoming book titled Material Witness. I also want to give a shout out to this new book edited by Annenberg's own Sharona Pearl, which includes an article um, by me about this research. <laughs> Double, yeah, double promotion here. OK, so having set this foundation, I want to tell a story. In December 2005, a young Polish immigrant named Kamila Garska disappeared from the town of Bedfordshire in the UK. The first evidence of her disappearance came when a passerby found a woman's clothes neatly folded by the edge of Bedfordshire's Priory Lake. A couple of days later, her boyfriend, a young Portuguese immigrant named Nico Bento, reported her disappearance to the police. He was ostensibly concerned because she left without warning, leaving behind her handbag in his flat, along with her cell phone and identification. 
Seven weeks after Nico Bento reported her missing, Camilla's body was pulled from Priory Lake. In their investigation, the Bedfordshire police discovered a surveillance video that apparently showed Camilla walking along the embankment of Priory Lake just before her death. And thanks to the analytical work of a forensic expert from the US named Casey Cottle, this video ended up being a key piece of evidence. Working for the Bedfordshire police, Cottle, Cottle analyzed the video and determined that it showed Camilla carrying a handbag right before her disappearance, which was later found in her boyfriend Nico's apartment. Armed with this compelling forensic video evidence, the police charged Nico Bento with the murder of Camilla Garska, and with Casey Cottle's expert testimony, Bento was convicted of killing her, and he went to prison to serve a life sentence. However, what was not revealed to Nico Bento's defense counsel, according to a BBC Newsnight report, was that the Bedfordshire police had engaged in what is sometimes called expert shopping. Before enlisting the help of Casey Cottle, the police had sought out a number of forensic scientists in the UK, all of whom told the investigators that they could not establish that the woman was in fact carrying a handbag in the video. One expert named John Kennedy from the UK Forensic Science Service reportedly advised the Bedfordshire police to, quote, exercise caution in relying on such poor quality video evidence. In a BBC interview, Kennedy relayed that he had told the police the only scientific process he would recommend to provide author an authoritative opinion as to whether the woman was carrying a handbag in the video would be to undertake a reverse projection. Reverse projection is a video forensic technique that involves reconstructing a scene captured on surveillance video using the same or similar conditions and using the, under the same or similar conditions, I'm sorry, using the same media and recording devices, positioned in the same way, and with the actual physical evidence. Then a software filter is used to overlay the images and to calculate and display the differences between the original images and the, those produced during the reconstruction. Casey Cotto had not performed a reverse projection as part of his analysis. He had merely enhanced the images to determine that the woman in the video was carrying a handbag. There are a variety of forensic techniques that analysts can use to enhance or clarify recorded video images to bring out visual details that aren't immediately visible or aren't visible when you're watching them as they are. But it's most often the case that poor quality, highly compressed video won't offer any new information using enhancement techniques. Enhancement rarely produces what forensic analysts call a CSI moment. So as you might guess, this story was not over. Thanks to a number of actors, including John Kennedy, the UK analyst who initially cautioned the police, a new and more competent lawyer who took on Bento's case, and a highly experienced video analyst from Canada named Grant Fredericks, Grant Fredericks Casey Cottle's forensic work was exposed as fraudulent. After serving two years and four months of his life sentence, Nico Bento was exonerated of Camilla's murder and released. He later won a libel case against the Bedfordshire police, who upon Bento's release from prison, made a public statement implying that he was a guilty man walking free. And on top of that, in the midst of the scandal over his fraudulent forensic work, Casey Cottle committed suicide. So what is the significance of this case, of falsified evidence exposed and wrongful conviction rectified? Clearly, there was a positive outcome for Nico Bento, if not for Casey Cottle, or for Camilla Garska, who had struggled with depression and may have committed suicide herself. Although not an especially well-known wrongful conviction case, it is an important one for the professional community of video forensics. So I want to explain why that is, but I first want to say more about the research that I've done um, for this project, what's involved in for, uh, video forensics, and tell you some of the things that I've discovered in my, my research. I'm going to um, make four points tonight. Okay, so for this research, I began uh, by looking at images and then at descriptions of video forensic systems in technical literature and for promotional material, uh, the promotional material of companies that are designing video forensic systems. Um, from there, I got a grant, and I uh, took a level one 
video forensics course with uh, the uh, LEVA, the association that I mentioned. Um, this course involved a combination of hands-on technical instruction with video forensics software and digital video, as well as lessons on field acquisition and legal admissibility issues and professional ethics. Half the time was spent in the LEVA Digital Multimedia Processing Lab, pictured here um, at my workstation, housed at the University of Ind Indianapolis, in case you thought I was doing this research to go to fun places. Um, the other half of the course was spent in classrooms where we had lectures from experienced forensic analysts, including Grant Fredericks, who we met in the Bento case, as well as a Crown Prosecutor from Canada who serves as LEVA's legal expert and advisor. I also took a, three, a short three-day expert witness um, course with the same prosecutor from Canada, designed specifically for video analysts, and I attended LEVA's annual conference um, in San Diego in 2013. So I, I've been conducting interviews with video analysts, which I'm still in the process of doing, uh, and I'm also looking at court cases, both court cases and news coverage of uh, cases involving video evidence. And I've recently discovered the television show See No Evil. I don't know if anyone's aware of this one, but this is about how real crimes are solved with the help of surveillance cameras. Police reveal how CCTV footage has unlocked the answer to cases that otherwise might have remained unsolved, leaving dangerous killers at large. The series features real footage, dramatic reconstruction, and combined with firsthand testimony from police, witnesses, and families. So I intend to take a closer look at this show as well. Okay, so what's involved in forensic video analysis? What have I learned about it? The LEVA definition of video forensics that I provided earlier, which is the scientific examination, comparison, and or evaluation in legal matters, which you have to learn how to memorize in level one LEVA training, it's a somewhat limited definition. It doesn't fully capture the range of activities that are involved in this field. Video forensic analysts actually perform all of the activities listed here, which is a list that I've copied from a PowerPoint slide in one of the training courses that I attended. So I want to go through some of these things to explain this. So the work of video forensics includes recovering video evidence from the field, also referred to as field acquisition. This would seem relatively straightforward until you realize how much is involved. Um, it is a much more challenging and complicated process than it would seem. There are no standards governing the form of video surveillance systems, so they take an exceedingly diverse range of forms. Larger systems can be hybrid assemblages of first, second, and third generation cameras, analog and digital technologies, wireless and wired connections, and multiple recording devices. The first thing that one has to do when trying to recover evidence from an unfamiliar CCTV system is map out the system, figure out the, the entire configuration of it, look at the backs of recording devices and trace out the wires, also disconnect any transmissions and stop any additional recording in order to prevent potentially relevant video from being overwritten. Um, and to make matters more complicated, an investigation may include multiple surveillance systems, so you may be doing this repeatedly. <laughs> um, I, I have a screen grab here from the Philadelphia Police Department Safe Cam program. Um, you can, if you are a business owner or an individual, anyone can register your own surveillance cameras with the uh, Philadelphia Police with their Safe Cam program, and that way, if there's a crime and they're trying to find some video, they don't have to go searching for cameras. They can just look in their registry and see if there are any cameras in the vicinity. So there are also no standards governing the recording devices themselves or the software on these devices. So programs, uh, the software programs running on these systems are almost always proprietary and protected, which causes problems for recovering video. Um, being able to play the video back on any other device than the one it was recorded on is a problem at times. Um, as I also learned in LEVA training, recovering video might require literally opening up the black box of a digital video recorder to examine the hard, the hard drive and other component parts. So the main challenge is recovering all of the relevant video and audio files I learned without adding compression, which can destroy um, the chances of gaining any usable evidence from the device. So the video is often al already highly compressed when in storage. So if you're looking at a video feed live, it might look really <coughs> beautiful and high resolution, but only a very small portion of that information is actually being recorded. So the, the goal is really to avoid adding any more compression to a device um, when you're recovering it. And it's very easy to add additional compression. So not surprisingly, video recovery or field acquisition of video is becoming its own specialized domain of expertise in video forensics. 
there are people who are really focusing on this as their profession. A second thing on the leave -a list of what video analysts do is clarify video evidence, which is what we're most familiar with um, from movies and television. This can mean a lot of different things, but most often it means trying to compensate for the image quality problems introduced by compression algorithms. Um, these images here are from another case that Grant Fredericks worked on, um, one of the, ex the experts that we met, and that I, uh, he's going to play a big role here. He's very, the, one of the foremost video forensics analysts. So this man in this image was convicted of murdering his wife based in part on this evidence from an ATM video. Her body is apparently there under the blanket in the passenger seat. Um, in any case, there's much more involved in turning this image on the left into this image on the right than simply turning up the brightness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The third uh, video analyst work activity on the list is uh, isolating camera views and creating timelines showing relevant events. So timing and temporality are extremely important evidentiary issues. And isolating particular camera views, creating timelines, was obviously an important, um, important for the Boston Marathon bombing investigation. This moment was actually, this, this case, this investigation was a very important one for the field of video forensics um, because it was such a high profile case and because there was uh, so, potentially so much video. It was a big win. <laughs> the, the speed with which these uh, individuals were identified was a very big win, not only for the FBI, but for, video, for the field of video forensics. Uh, interpre interpretation and narrative. So interpreting and narrativizing video. In other words, not necessarily doing much to the video itself, but providing one's expert interpretation of what's depicted in recorded video, suggesting what viewers should and should not see in the images based on one's expert understanding of compression algorithms and the like. Sometimes image, in, in highly compressed images, uh, there, are, there is information missing that, that you know, is key information, and you have to be able to know that that information might be missing and why. Um, or and often in compression can add things to images that um, aren't actually there in the real world. OK, so performing reverse proje projection and comparison work is the fifth item on this list, um, something we were introduced to in the Bento case. And I'm also going to say a little bit more about this in a minute. Authenticating, verifying video, and verifying video evidence, which means proving chain of custody and ensuring that nothing was done to the video to distort what it visually represents. So actual video forensics actually involves doing a lot of work on images and changing the video files. And you have to be able to establish as an analyst that you didn't do anything, you didn't do too much. Uh, you, you did something, but not too much. OK. And finally, consulting. And my notes are lacking on this. And I don't remember what was said about consulting. <laughs> but um, I'm going to use this last item on the list to point out that video forensics is not only something done by law enforcement and state agencies. There's a growing private sector uh, in video forensic services including this company called Forensic Video Solutions. And you might recognize the man in this image who we met earlier, <laughs> Grant Fredericks. He, um, he used to work for the Canadian police. Uh, now he has his own company. He's also an instructor for the FBI and for LEVA. And he's really one of the foremost video forensic analysts. I assume that, I don't know, but I assume that his services are highly sought after. There's actually more involved in video forensics, even than uh, the seven items on this list of activities that I borrowed from uh, the LEVA training course that I took. I want to add just two more things that I think are really important for understanding the scope of this field and what the, it does. The first one is video evidence asset management. So the term evidence asset management comes from media asset management or digital asset management, which is these are terms that refer to the proprietary management of one's media assets or holdings. A, a company typically, a companies, news organizations have uh, filmmakers. You know, there's a lot of a lot of people use this kind of um, terminology. It, it's, it sort of uses the language of finance to describe media management, which makes sense because media asset management is typically associated with media monetization. The work of video forensics is as much about the archival or database management of video as it is about analyzing individual images. Even one case can have significant database management demands, especially if there's video from multiple sources that needs to be compiled and tagged and coordinated with other evidence. So this is a really learning how to, uh, and, and the workflows involved in evidence, in evidence asset management is a huge part of this field. 
There's a uh, second thing I want to add to the list is what I'm calling, uh, what I would call analyst sourcing, to connect it to but also differentiate it from crowdsourcing. And what I mean by this is that um, there is this kind of scale issue that comes into play you, when you harness the skills of multiple analysts to work on cases involving large volumes of video. Um, the example that I'm most familiar with because it was discussed in the LEVA training is the Vancouver Stanley Cup riot investigation. Whomever was in charge of the investigation called in a team of video analyst, analysts who worked together in the LEVA processing lab here to, to process and tag tens of thousands of hours of video assets compiled in that investigation. And um, it's the kind of job that one person would take years to do by bringing people together. It's a very powerful sort of manpower issue there. Um, and they were able to tag all these you know, events criminal events happening in these videos. Um, it's, a, it's a little sobering when you think about that same kind of um, effort being applied to sort of other kinds of crowd um, uh, investigation uh, uh, cases. I grabbed this image of the LEVA lab from a LEVA document that's titled Activating the Forensic Response Team. So they have a kind of program where you can activate their response team and you can call them up and um, get people, of course, for a price. Uh, bring people into this lab, get analysts to come in and to work on the, a case. It's interesting that the lab is actually empty of people, <laughs> but it's sort of sending the message that the lab is at the ready for your needs. One interesting thing I, would, I wanted to add, too, is that, you know, when the Boston Marathon bombing investigation was uh, playing out, I was just... I didn't know what was going on. I, have no, I was not privy to anything. But I sort of was speculating about how that was happening, how they were gathering video. And I assumed that the people um, associated with Leva were involved, but they were not involved. It turned out that the FBI has its own teams of experts, and there's a whole communities of these experts that I'm, you know, it's kind of beyond my threshold of perception. Um, I did end up uh, interviewing an FBI agent in San Diego who was more privy to this investigation and had this kind of insight, sort of opened up another world to me of um, really uh, <laughs> interesting different kinds of perspectives on this. Okay, or and, and a whole other domain of sort of digital imaging forensics that um, the expertise at, and there is probably even beyond what Leva, the Leva folks can do, although Grant Fredericks himself is probably associated with uh, and is an instructor at the FBI in this area. Okay, so that should give you some idea of what's involved in forensic video analysis. So now I'm going to tell you um, what I've discovered or my, my four main points that I want to make about this tonight. Okay, so one of the main arguments that I'm making in this work is that the status of recorded video as evidence is the result of an intentional process of production. While the evidentiary value of recorded surveillance video may seem self-evident, in fact, the indexicality of evidentiary images has to be produced. Video forensics is a media production process, and this production process has both material and technical dimensions, as well as rhetorical and discursive ones. One example that demonstrates this pretty well, the way in which the indexicality of images has to be produced, is the time code plug-in feature typical of video forensic systems. So this is a software tool that allows users to paste a time date stamp onto a video if one doesn't already appear on the image, or if the analyst determines that the time needs to be corrected, and the time often needs to be corrected. There can be multiple time date stamps on one image, and they could have different times and dates on them. Um, so they, they, these things are not, off, they're often wrong. Although obviously the potential for sort of falsifying evidence is there. The banality of the digital clock imprinted on a surveillance image belies the importance of the time date stamp in providing an authoritative temporal indicator visible to viewers. The time date stamp assigns precise timing to the event depicted, including both the exact moment in the past when the event occurred, as well as the amount of time that elapsed as the event unfolded. The time code plug-in feature allows one to imprint a form of temporal indexicality onto recorded images, literally inserting a specific past moment of time onto an image that might otherwise visually document an indefinite moment in time, something that could have happened at any time. And I'm borrowing the term temporal indexicality from Thomas Levine's excellent study of surveillance narration in cinema. Okay, image clarification methods are also techniques of media production that aim to invest images with evidentiary meaning. 
One example is frame averaging, a technique that can sometimes bring out details in video images that aren't otherwise possible to see, such as a license plate number or a person's face. Again, it's most often the case that it's impossible to get any more information, useful information from compressed video. Um, uh, you there's just nothing else you can do. But occasionally, in this case in particular, they, they were able to get um, more visual quality. Frame averaging involves manually selecting the frames from a compressed video file that contain the most visual information, the iframes, or the fully specified pictures, unlike the frames in between, which contain much less data. There's fewer of these iframes, fully specif specified picture frames, in the, the more compression you have. You then select the particular region of the iframes that you've gathered from the video that contain the desired visual information, apply a software filter that aligns the frames, and then averages them to see whether the combined visual data reveals more detail. Okay, and this is actually a pretty time-consuming process because you have to manually pull out the uh, iframes. And um, so you ha it's typical that forensic analysts, I mean, they, you really need to learn to know whether you're gonna be able to get anything before you even try. Um, and, and that's sort of part of becoming a forensic analyst, kind of having that level of understanding. Um, the resulting image represents an altered form from the original. It's, it's something like a composite of multiple video frames, as I understand it. Okay, this kind of image clarification technique was used on video taken of George Zimmerman at the Sanford Police Station in Florida the night he killed Trayvon Martin. If you recall, Zimmerman claimed that he was in an altercation with Martin and that Martin was banging his head on the sidewalk. ABC News aired surveillance video from the Sanford Police Station appearing to show that Zimmerman was unharmed. However, about a week later, they aired a new version of the video that appeared to show a pair of gashes or welts on Zimmerman's head. So there are a number of differences between these before and after images of Zimmerman in the, arriving in the police station. One obvious difference is that the after image has a sharper visual quality. The two images are of slightly different seconds of time, but represent more or less the same scene. They both display highlighting techniques designed to direct the viewer's attention to particular details in the images. In this case, Zimmerman's head. On the left, we see a red circle that looks like it's crudely drawn by hand, and on the right, a visual effect generated by a software filter that darkens the image except for the selected region where our attention is being drawn. We also see a number of things imprinted on the right image, the website of the company that did the imaging work, forensicprotection.com, and the ABC News logo in the lower right corner, and also a time date stamp. In addition to being produced as evidence, the video here is being produced as a branded promotional pitch for both the forensic imaging company and the television news organization, both of which are here laying claim to the uh, forensic image work on display. And this was, this was actually really curious to me, this incident. Like, as soon as I saw, I saw the first airing of the video and I thought, anyone who knew, <laughs> anyone who had gone through level one leave a training would know that you couldn't necessarily determine from the image that there were no gashes or welts because of the compression of that. That's a compressed image and there very well may be gashes or welts. So for the ABC, I was curious why ABC News wouldn't have anybody with enough expertise in digital video to know this. Um, and so I was kind of suspicious being such a conspiracy theorist that, um, that, that they were like, they knew they were gonna be able to air a correction story somehow. Um, or at the very least, I think it raises the question of what happened that made ABC News send the video out for this extra production work. Perhaps someone called their attention to the fact that um, they might be able to get more information uh, from this compressed video. But in any case, I guess we could certainly say that here, the video forensic analysis itself becomes the story and sort of more or less eclipses the other issues involved here. That video forensics is a media production process is also apparent in the technique of reverse projection, which is essentially crime scene reconstruction for the cameras. The forensic methods of crime scene reconstruction have been around for some time, and it's definitely not a new practice to photograph or take video of crime scene reconstructions. However, reverse projection is different in that it's done specifically to compare images. The scene is staged and the new images are produced with the goal of being able to gain more information through a comparative analysis of the original images that are themselves the evidence in question or part of the evidence. 
as one can imagine, crime scene reconstruction can be a little messy and even dubious as a scientific technique. I don't know that much about it, honestly, but I did find a book as recent as 2013, which I haven't read yet, but I find the title pretty telling. Scientific Foundations of Crime Scene Reconstruction, Introducing Method to Mayhem. So the general point I want to make about reverse projection is that it's a media production process that aims to invest recorded video images with evidentiary value. That video forensics shares common ground with creative media production is a recognized problem for the field. Analysts can often be heard making explicit efforts to distinguish these two domains and repudiating any form of creative license or creative subjectivity they might have. For example, in an article on a new reverse projection technique using 3D laser scanning, Grant Fredericks explains, what's really important to us is that we want to remove art from what we do as much as possible. When we do a scan, we're not using any art. We're using scientific data. So it might seem unsurprising that the field would want to distinguish itself from art, obviously, but the fact that they feel compelled to make these kinds of statements is itself kind of telling, and it gives support to the connections that they're trying to deny in some ways. Grant Frederick's company, um, Forensic Video Solutions, is developing this forensic technique of using 3D scanner, a 3D scanner to scan the actual space that's captured in a surveillance video. And then they create a 3D version of what's depicted in the original video in order to do the comparative work and analyze the scene. So uh, I think this is mostly being used for accident reconstruction right now to determine sort of what happened in accidents. This is definitely the future of the f future direction in video forensics using these 3D scanners. And in fact, you know, maybe the 3D video will already be captured in the field as the original images. I have no idea. I'm not predicting the future exactly. So. OK, so partly because of its relationship to creative media production, the formation of the field of video forensics is fraught with struggles for legitimacy. And this is my second main point, that participants in this domain actively work to define video forensics as a legitimate, objective science. Obviously, statements that distinguish video forensics from art are clear examples of this, but it's not only the association with media production that raises challenges to the field's legitimacy. The forensic sciences in general have often tenuous claims to scientific credibility. And this was highlighted in a now well-known 2009 report from the National Academy of Sciences. The report identified a host of problems with forensic labs in the US and with the fields of forensic sciences. And it particularly emphasized the need for the forensic fields to create a culture of science, as they termed it, distinct from law enforcement culture. So video forensics is caught up in the same, some of the same issues facing other forensic sciences. I thought this website captured this pretty well. It's the website of a company called Final Analysis Forensics. So they're, they're taking a truly scientific approach to evaluating and investigating evidence. Leva has responded to the need to build the field's legitimacy by developing a professional training and credentialing program. They've created two levels of professional certification, the technician level and then the analyst, higher level analyst designation. I've been using the term analyst as a catch term for any human being working in this field, but in reality, the people that I'm referring to as, an as analysts have a wide range of different skills and skill levels, and those skills are in constant flux. For the purposes of LEVA certification, the analyst designation is reserved for individuals who've gone through the highest level of LEVA training and have successfully completed a whole series of written and oral examinations. So there aren't that many people that have this analyst designation. I think I. Um, there's like 50 or less. And unlike those of us who are awarded PhDs um, in perpetuity, this certification expires. Analysts have to um, be recertified periodically through additional requirements. I guess we probably have to you know, prove ourselves, recertify ourselves in certain kinds of ways. OK, so um, LEVA as an organization is actively engaged in establishing itself, or trying to establish itself, as the go-to organization for credentialing in the field. However, there isn't necessarily any consensus among everyone engaged in this work um, that you have to have a LEVA certification. And there's no federal or state policy that says that, you know, that mandates LEVA certification to do video forensics. One is not required to have LEVA certification to qualify as an expert witness in court, for example, although it may, in fact, help you qualify. It might, it might give you some credibility and uh, enable you to qualify. 
I should point out that Casey Cottle, our, uh, the, fraud, the person who engaged in fraud in the Bento case, had LEVA certification and was trained by Grant Fredericks. Um, LEVA revoked his certification when it became clear to them what he had done in the Bento case. Okay, so no images for a minute. Um, these struggles for the legitimacy of the field arise in the trial courts, and this is in some ways where they matter most. I learned quite a bit about this in a LEVA uh, course that I took okay. called um, Courtroom Testimony for Forensic Video Anal Analysis. According to the instructor, a prosecutor who's tried many cases involving video evidence, one of the main challenges to qualifying as an expert witness in court is a common assumption among judges that, in fact, no expertise should be needed to interpret video images. In other words, in his view, or in this view, I should say, in this view, the only issue should be admissibility. Can the video images be authenticated? Can the chain of custody be established? And is the video evidence relevant to the case? Some judges view any effort to direct attention or suggest a particular interpretation of images as potentially prejudicial. And the instructor of the leave, of course, um, relayed his own experiences at times having to fight to justify bringing in a video expert. So this makes it incumbent upon video analysts to be able to explain why the court needs them, what they can do that the jury and others in the courtroom cannot. And this, this kind of skepticism about uh, the need for video expertise puts a heavier burden on video experts than experts in other fields of forensics like ballistics or DNA typing, for example. Another place where, we, where the legitimacy of the entire field of video forensics is sometimes ch uh, challenged is, is in the adversarial process. Uh, specifically as a strategy of cross-examination, trying to discredit the witness. And this includes efforts um, by defense attorneys to, um, usually defense attorneys, to associate the field with creative production, saying something, you know, trying to link the, uh, saying there's a lot of creativity involved. Something that surprised me about this course that I took on courtroom testimony is how much of it was focused on what I would call the emotional economy of the courtroom. So um, much of the instruction uh, was sort of around the importance of affect comportment and how to modulate one's emotional um, state and perform expertise appropriately in the courtroom, rather than on the specifics of you know, preparing and presenting one's analytical results. So it's not that the actual testimony piece was ignored, but it just seemed like for a room full of police officers in training to be forensic scientists, there was a lot of talk about feelings. It was, it was the, like for three days. There was a lot of talk about how do you, how did that, we did moot courts and it was the first thing you do after you, you know, go through the whole performance of, uh, you know, your expert testimony in these moot courts is say how you felt, you know, how did you, how did that make you feel? Um, okay, so it was just fascinating. Um, this discussion of the courtroom testimony course that I took brings me to a third point I want to make about the uh, field of video forensics a point that is in some ways unsurprising, but nonetheless needs to be said. Namely, that it has a decidedly prosecutorial orientation. This was apparent in repeated references in the training courses to the need to, for analysts in training to resist the pressure from coming from superiors and coming from prosecuting, prosecuting attorneys and detectives to give them the evidence that they're looking for to secure convictions. This was also mentioned by my interview respondents who tended to describe this in more measured terms of managing expectations of detectives and prosecutors and in a sense sort of giving themselves a little bit more agency. The prosecutorial orientation of the Leva courtroom testimony course was no doubt because the instructor was himself a prosecutor. This is him. He did emphasize in the introduction to the course that convicting the innocent is one of the gravest injustices of the criminal legal system and that the prosecutor has the responsibility to ensure that the, a defendant gets a fair trial. He also emphasized that the results of one's forensic analyst, uh, an analysis should be the same no matter what side one's working for. However, the assumption that ran through the course and structured the lessons that was that the people who were there taking this course would be providing expert testimony for the criminal prosecutions, not for defense, the side of the defense. The, the instructor explained that video evidence is almost always submitted by the state. It's very rare for the defense to submit video evidence or call a, a video expert to testify. 
in criminal cases. He even went so far as to say that there, uh, in the rare cases, when the defense does have a video expert, that person is typically lacking in legitimate expertise. And he, the term that was often used to describe people who were just quacks in this area is vi wedding videographers. It was also noted that defense attorneys usually don't know the right questions to ask of video experts on cross-examination. So they bark up the wrong trees and don't bark up the right ones, in other words. Um, and this is not, these were not the words that, uh, that this instructor used, but he did make judicious use of humor in this class. He was actually a very gifted educator, um, and I learned a lot from him uh, in terms of not just about uh, video, the, the legal issues of uh, and testifying as an expert witness, but just pedagogically, it's kind of a rare instance when you get to be a um, student in a class and see how someone else teaches. Uh, he was very gifted. And you know, th the three-day course, which was grueling, I mean, eight hours a day for three days straight, uh, taught by one instructor, and he just never lost any energy, and he was very um, ethical and professional. So, and he had, you know, placed a strong emphasis on ethics and trying to instill in the participants this ethical subjectivity. So w my point about uh, the prosecutorial bias here is not an indictment of any of these individuals. Legal scholars have identified this problem of an imbalance of favor, uh, imbalance of power in favor of the prosecution in the criminal justice system, broadly speaking. And certainly the uh, issue of inadequate defense uh, legal representation is a recognized problem, although one that probably doesn't receive uh, enough attention or resources. According to the legal scholar Simon Cole, forensic scientists seem to view vigorous adversarialism, that is, strong defense counsel, as merely a method to thwart justice on behalf of guilty criminal observers. I'm not, I'm not sure that this is fair to say of all forensic scientists, but I, I couldn't help but observe in the courses that I took that there, is an, there was an assumption that was sometimes subtle and sometimes very explicit that defendants are on trial because they're guilty. And it's the job of the forensic expert to present their findings in a way that establishes this without being too emotional about it and uh, losing credibility. So these issues are tied to two various serious problems endemic to the legal system, falsification of evidence, which can be intentional or inadvertent, and wrongful conviction. Issues highlighted in the story that I began with, Nico Bento's uh, criminal trial. And certainly the DeBento case suggests that the criminal justice system actually works and that, like DNA evidence, video evidence can just as soon exonerate as incriminate a suspect. Of course, seeing justice served in this case requires sort of diminishing the importance of the two years and four months that Bento spent in prison, not to mention the experience of being charged and tried and the impact that a prison term has on the rest of one's life. Still, Bento was fortunate that there were experts who were suspicious of Caudill's forensic analysis and decided to probe into the case further. And one can imagine that this is not always the case. This will not always be the case. Grant Fredericks really deserves a lot of credit here um, for, doing, uh, for, for what, writing the wrong in this case. He traveled to the UK multiple times to, um, to testify on behalf of Nico Bento. Uh, the, and um, so again, I would say that none of what I have to say about the prosecutorial bias of this field should be read as an attack on any of these individuals who I think are very ethically minded subjects. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip a few of that. So I'm gonna just, uh, I've argued that, I'm gonna come to my fourth and final point. I've argued that the status of video as evidence involves an intentional process of production that the field is engaged for struggles for its status as a legitimate science, and that it has a prosecutorial orientation. These three things exist in tension with the fourth and final point I want to make about the field of forensic video analysis. What we see emerging in this domain are new ways of thinking about and engaging in the practices of objectivity associated with images and image analysis, what I'm calling computational objectivity. Here I'm drawing on Lorraine Dastin and Peter Gallison's historical analysis of the changing epistemic virtues associated with objectivity in the domain of scientific images. They use the term mechanical objectivity to refer to the type associated with photography and other visualizing instruments developed in the 19th century. Proponents of mechanical objectivity subscribed to the belief that mechanical devices could be used to produce scientific images that were uncontaminated by interpretation in contrast to the artistically rendered 
true to nature illustrations that populated scientific atlases until then. Photography promised to remove the individual scientist's judgment and the biasing hand of the illustrator from scientific image making. However, photography and other mechanical visualization techniques never made good on this promise, and the problem of subjective interpretation persisted. What emerged in the 20th century as an acceptable avenue to objectivity was the epistemic virtue of trained judgment. In this view, objectivity could best be achieved through the analytical abilities and interpretive skills of well-trained scientists. What we see emerging in the field of forensic video analysis, and possibly other fields as well, are the contours of a new epistemic virtue of objectivity. A belief in computational objectivity holds that neutral forms of image analysis can be achieved by delegating certain forms of trained judgment to algorithms and computer techniques, computational techniques. So in reality, this is a much bigger idea and future possibility than it is a reality. There are already some very basic perceptual and analytical tasks that can be performed by software and computation. Um, for example, there are software programs that can track a moving object in an image or match images of faces with um, some degree of accuracy. But most of the heavy lifting of the uh, perception and analysis of images in, um, for legal or scientific purposes must still be done by human beings. Of course, not just any human beings, but people with particular kinds of technical and perceptual skills. And more specifically, human beings who themselves have acquired the capacity for computational vision. Becoming a forensic video analyst involves developing the capacity to see computationally. One needs to learn to look at and understand images with a computational eye. For example, analysts learning how to understand how different image compression algorithms affect the appearance of images. They need to understand that. They need to be able to do that themselves without any assistance. In fact, you're told in, uh, in level one training that by the time you're done with level two training, you have to be able to tell things, automatically be able to determine things like compression rates and uh, differentiate all kinds of sort of things that one would not be able to do without a trained eye. They have to learn the range of software tools available to work on those images and know the possibilities and limitations available for uh, working on the images. They also have to understand what has to be done manually which, what, and what has more um, automated and automated solutions. There's a lot of things that I could uh, uh, use as examples here. So it's by acquiring computational vision and applying and communicating that interpretive perspective that forensic video analysts aim to establish their own professional credibility and the status of their field as a legitimate science. And a belief in computational objectivity is what allows surveillance images, sometimes significantly altered from their original form, to function as authoritative evidence, partly. It's also what's allowing the police and the prosecutorial legal system to speak with renewed authority with and about these images after an initial period when the vast majority of surveillance footage had very little or no evidentiary value. So I, I just want to be clear that I'm not I've talked. About, I've delivered this uh, argument before, and sometimes people get confused and think that I'm actually arguing that computational techniques can, in fact, produce objective or technically neutral forms of image analysis. And I'm not arguing that. In fact, I think an important point to understand about computational objectivity is that, along with the effort to achieve it, there is a renewal of the questionable promise associated with the 19th century idea of mechanical objectivity, namely that the idea that the subjective and interpretable in the subjective, imperfect perceptual capacities of human beings can be eliminated from images and their interpretation. Okay, I'm gonna conclude by returning to the Bento case, or what we, what we should call the Casey Cottle case. In the BBC coverage of the case, the forensic analyst Grant Fredericks corrects the record. Fredericks does the important boundary work of performing the role of real expert, ethical and well-trained professional who does what reporter Peter Marshall explains ought to have been done from the start, a reverse projection or crime scene reconstruction. Fredericks offers a clear explanation of the technique and interprets the images in a way that suggests absolute certainty. This is definitive, Fredericks proclaims. There was no handbag at the scene when Camilla walked by the camera. If Casey Cottle's victory in the UK courts initially seemed important for the field of video forensics, his exposure as fraud carries even more symbolic weight. Even as it demonstrates what can go wrong in this domain of expertise, the story ultimately does important legitimacy work for the field, 
namely, namely by proving it capable of policing itself and its boundaries of expertise. It demonstrates this internally as a cautionary tale told to analysts in training and as a boundary marking tale for the field more broadly. It also uh, lends legitimacy to the field externally, to the broader public that's paying attention, and especially to the legal system, which is not universally convinced that there's a need for expertise in video analysis. The BBC report on the Bento case concludes with a brief comment from the Bedfordshire police chief. When asked why the police had not staged a reconstruction, the chief replied that he was advised that, quote, a reconstruction shouldn't be done and wouldn't be of value. And he added, quote, the reconstruction that has been done, I think, is of questionable value. This challenge to the authority of the new results does more than show that the police don't like their work to be scrutinized or their authority to be challenged, although those things are both true. It also suggests that there's no consensus within law enforcement about this domain of expertise or about the appropriate range of techniques being developed for producing evidence from surveillance video. It seems that the Bedfordshire police were willing to accept the credibility of forensic video analysis as long as the results supported the case they were trying to build against their suspect. I learned about this case in, this, in a section of the Level 1 LEVA training course that I took titled Ethics and the Expert Witness. It was used as a cautionary tale, an instructional test case against which video analysts in training are encouraged to form their own ethical professional identities. The way this case was presented, both in the forensics training and in the news coverage it received in the UK, held Casey Cottle out as an exceptionally unprofessional, if tragic, figure whose fate, not necessarily his suicide, but his exposure as a fraud, was inevitable. Even better, the ultimate outcome of the case was presented as the result of the proper workings of the legal system and the diligence and professional ethics of good forensic analysts. In short, the Casey Cottle case was used to invoke fraudulent forensic practices, not to dismantle the authority of video forensics, but to establish a need for this domain of expertise and to invest it with authority. Thank you. <laughs>